Hi, everybody. It's great to be here with all of you. Probably, um, like me, you were watching the uh, inauguration today. Were you? Some of you? Yeah, it was. It was good. It was inspiring. I was very happy about it uh, to hear the great performers and the wonderful poet. Big relief for me, anyway. I don't know how you feel about it, but uh, for me, it's a big relief. <clears throat> it's odd uh, this phenomenon of. Uh, you know, a national mood or a national spirit. How, how could there be such a thing? I mean, there isn't any such thing. There's just however many hundreds of millions of people there are within these artificial borders and the sum total of their thoughts and words and deeds, far too complex to summarize in any way. And yet at the same time, you know, there is a shared feeling some kind of a national mood. So this morning we had a gigantic mood swing, right? <laughs> wow, big mood swing. Upward, I think. A mood swing for the better. And of course, nobody knows uh, what will happen exactly. How could anybody know what will happen? Nobody ever knows what happens next. Uh, but we've had a mood swing, and that's great, in my opinion. And uh, also, before the mood swing, uh, during the mood swing, and subsequent to the mood swing, we have had faith and confidence in our practice anyway to see us through whatever uh, would happen. So that's still true. Also, uh, preliminary to uh, talking about this wonderful story of uh, the woman Guan, I would like to uh, dedicate uh, my talk this afternoon, or I guess, is, is it almost evening where you are? I guess it is evening. I guess we're in different places all over the world. Here in California, it is a late afternoon, just about evening. I would like to dedicate uh, my talk to my teacher, Hakuryu, Sojin Dayosho, great priest, white drag in essential purity, uh, Mel Weitzman, mostly known as Sojin Roshi, who left this world on January the 7th. And there are many, many traditional rituals that a disciple does for a teacher. And Kathy and I have been doing these rituals and they've been a great comfort to us to think about them and prepare for them and carry them out. Mel was a dear friend and teacher to us for uh, 50 years. And we will always be grateful to him for his undying teaching and support. It is a little bit hard to adjust at the fact, to the fact that we won't be able to see him on Kathy's birthday, as we always did. Kathy and his wife, Liz, have almost the same birthday, so we always got together then, and other times we won't be able to see him then. And it's hard to uh, remember that he is actually gone in a way, uh, but in another way, not gone. So my talk today is for him. And I think the case that uh, I'm talking about, the 19th case of the woman gone, gateless barrier, the woman con really reminds me a lot of Mel. 
This is a story about uh, Zsa Zsa, one of the greatest of all Zen masters and, and actually a, a personal favorite of mine. He, he lived to a very old age, but this story is from a time when he was still a young disciple living with his teacher, Nanjuan. And uh, I was talking to Hozan, Alan Sanaki, the other day. And I was saying, you know, you're just like Zhao Zhou. Alan, Alan is like Zhao Zhou. Alan, as you know, is, I think I said this, uh, Mel's successor in Berkeley. And it's a very unusual thing. It's sort of an ideal archetype, but actually it almost never happens that somebody comes to their teacher when they're pretty young at the beginning of their practice and they stay with their teacher in the temple for decades and decades and decades as Zhao Zhao did and also as Hozan did. And then the teacher passes away and as Hozan is doing, you take over the abbacy of the temple. Zhao Zhao came to Nanchuan as a young man and remained with him until Nan Shuan's death, around 40 years. And then at the age of 60, Zsa Zsa went off on pilgrimage to polish and challenge his practice. And he did that for 20 years and 20 years later settled down in a town near a famous bridge where he lived for 20 years more, uh, encountering Zen students with his relaxed, humble and simple wisdom. Maybe because he began uh, to teach at such an advanced age, Zsa, Zsa had nothing to prove. You know, he didn't have to prove Zen or express Zen. Wouldn't that be a great condition to be in? to have nothing to prove. Maybe that's even awakening itself, right? Just having nothing to prove, nothing to defend, nothing to uphold, but just respond to every moment of your life without anything to prove. Unlike other uh, Zen teachers famous in the literature, Zhao Zhou didn't raise his voice or shake his staff or hit anybody or utter too many flabbergasting words. His expressions were on the whole pretty plain and matter of fact, and maybe even disappointingly ordinary until you thought for a second about what he was saying and the profundity came through. Maybe this plain and easy style came not only from his age and from his long years of practice and probably from his natural personality, maybe they also came from this story, case 19, which is about an insight that he shared with his teacher when he was young. So here's the story. Zhao Zhao asked Nanchuan, what is the way? Nanchuan replied, everyday mind is the way. Zhao Zhao said, if everyday mind is the way, how do I direct myself toward it? Nanchuan replied, if you direct yourself toward it, you will be going in exactly the wrong direction. Zhao Zhao said, but if I don't direct myself toward it, how can I know it? And Nanchuan said, the way is not a matter of knowing and not knowing. Knowing is an exaggeration. Not knowing is stupid. Once you enter the way, 
you'll know it is as vast as space. What does that have to do with yes and no thinking? And hearing these words, Zhao Zhou understood for himself. I think that's a great story. What is the way? What a question, especially for a young monastic. It's like a child looking up and saying, what is that blue sky? Because if you're a monastic like Jajo, your whole life, every minute of it is devoted to study of the way reading texts, hearing lectures, engaging in ritual and dialogue and reflection and all day long, your life is nothing but the life of the way, which is as present for you and as obvious as the blue sky. The blue sky covers our heads all the time, which is why we don't really pay much attention to it. So it's a beautiful thing that Zhao Zhou asks such a simple and fundamental question as a child would ask. How come we're here in this monastery? What, what are we doing? Why, why are we putting on these robes? How come we're bowing to these statues? How come we're studying these strange sutras? Teacher, what's this really about? The Chinese word for way is Tao. That's how the Chinese translated the Buddhist word for way or path. And the word Tao was a word long ensconced in Chinese religious thought before Buddhism ever came. And it does mean path or method, way, but at the same time, it actually means simultaneously, as if the two concepts were identical, truth, essence, reality. So Nanchuan's answer to Zhao Zhou's question is already there in the question, in the word Tao, which means both the way and the truth. The way to the truth is the truth. And the truth is the way to the truth. And this is a uniquely Chinese idea. And I think Buddhism was transformed in many ways through its encounter with Chinese thought and culture. And this is one way that it was transformed. The understanding that the truth is not an insight or a concept or even an experience. It's a way. It's a path. Taoism, which was the ancient Chinese religion in which the concept of Tao was central, understood the Tao as the eternal way, the way of nature, the way of heaven, the way things naturally flowed. This is a concept that's quite different from the way that we now in our materialistic, scientific culture see things. There's a big difference for us between process and goal. We set goals and we wanna realize those goals. That's the point of any process that we would engage in to achieve the goal that the process is set up to achieve which is practical, makes sense, right? We all do this. If, for example, like we were hearing this morning, 
we want to have a goal of national unity, we have to have a path toward that goal, which will involve the way we speak and think and behave, doing things with unification rather than division in our mind. If we want to end racism someday, which we really need to do, we actually need a path to achieve that goal. It's not enough to just wish for it. We need a path to achieve that goal. If we want the earth not to burn up under our feet, we need a process, a path, a plan to ensure that this will one day be so. And these are all goals, stated goals of the present government. And that's why our mood is swinging up because these goals were not stated goals before and now they are. So I sincerely hope that now, today, we're on a new path and we have new goals and we'll reach those goals, however slow or frustrating it may be to get there, we will accomplish these goals. So don't get me wrong, goals and paths to goals are very important. But in the word Tao, and in Chinese culture from ancient times, process and goal are the same. You act and live in accordance with Tao forever. The path is the goal. And the question is not how or why, sorry, the question is not why or what, the question is how, how do we live? How do we get along? So that's why metaphysical concerns in Chinese thought were expressed by this word Tao, which means path. In, in Buddhism, there is a word for path, marga. But in Buddhism, there are words like nirvana, the goal of the path, which means cessation or peace, or bodhi, the goal of the path, which means awakening. In Chinese thought, the word Tao includes all of this. So when Zhaozhou asks, what is the Tao, the way, he's asking really two things at once. What's the truth? What's real? What's the essence of this human life? And also, how do I practice? What spirit, what attitude, what practices should I be cultivating? And these are the best questions for a monastic, young or old, living in the monastery or at home. And, and what an innocent question. You know, I really admire Zhao Zhou's great innocence. Sometimes I think, you know, to take up spiritual practice, you have to be naive. You know, you have to be innocent. A cynical person, you know, can't do this. Maybe we're all cynical too, but we have to sort of table that for the moment if we want to do this practice. And... Uh, I think I'm still naive myself, you know, even though I'm old now, you know, I'm still like naive, I think. Good, I'm glad. Maybe you also are naive. And did you ever think, you know, the Buddha was pretty naive? I mean, how childish is it to think to yourself? Well, Sickness, old age, and death are pretty big human problems, but by golly, I'm gonna solve them. I'm gonna solve these problems. I'm not sure how, 
but I'm going to do it. And then you go and do it. I mean, who would ever think such a thing? You got to be really naive. Or maybe you could say arrogant, <laughs> you know, really arrogant to think that you could do this. Only a privileged young man, right, could, could think that he would go forth and solve such a problem. But anyway, as the story goes, the Buddha did have this thought, he did go forth, and he carried out his path and achieved his goal. He asked ultimate questions and gave his life to them. I think most of us don't really give our lives to ultimate questions. Maybe someplace in us, all of us do ask those ultimate questions, but I think we quickly forget about them because there's so many other things pressing in for our attention. And one of the things that happens when we take up practice, I think, is we rediscover those places in ourselves where these ultimate questions, the real human questions, have been lying in wait inside of us. The questions that our serious adult lives have told us must be tabled because after all, there really aren't any answers to these questions. So why would we waste our time on them? Anyway, we have goals, we have plans, we have needs, we have bills to pay, families to take care of, careers to establish, who has time? for this pie in the sky. And Nanchuan's beautiful response to Zhao Zhou is a little surprising, I think. Everyday mind is the way. Everyday mind is the answer to these most ultimate questions. What is truth? What is path? Just this, just to live, just to be alive every single minute of every single day. What an answer, <laughs> not what, what you would expect or what you would be looking for probably. The truth, the essence of everything, the path, Obviously, this is something profound, lofty, mystical, exalted. You don't know it, but no. Everyday mind is the way. Nothing more, but also nothing less. So I translate this word in the case um, everyday. A lot of people translate it as ordinary, which is also a good translation. The word in Chinese etymology <clears throat> suggests something that is normal, ordinary, everyday, repeated. In other words, ordinarily, everyday, routinely, constant, and therefore, in a way, eternal. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, mathematically, eternity is not a lengthy expanse of time because any expanse of time you could think of, that you could think of that expanse of time plus one, right? <laughs> so it's not an amount of time. What is eternity? It must be what's common, what's repeated over and over always, all the time. And what is constant? the sun coming up, the sun going down, the sun moving through the sky. Moments of time succeeding one another on and on and on. Standing up, sitting down, 
waking up in the morning, going to sleep at night, eating, shitting, cleaning up, giving birth, dying. Sun, moon, stars, the daily effort to clean everything up and take care of your life. The way the mind is, the way consciousness goes, its function, constantly, daily, changing. That's the way. We don't need anything else. And to think that we need something else means we're missing what's right in front of us. I've been in this business of Zen practice for quite a long time. And I've talked to many, many people. And, and I see that people who take up spiritual practice usually have reasons. All of you have reasons. And mostly the reasons are negative. Maybe some suffering, some pain, some dissatisfaction, some trouble. Maybe the trouble and the suffering have been severe enough to make it impossible to go on with your life as it was. Or maybe it's not like that. It's not like that for everybody, for sure. Maybe everything is more or less okay. But you have to admit, you know, when you're quiet and you're in a reflective moment, uh, something isn't quite right. Something missing. And you can ignore that feeling for years. It's just sort of bothersome, but you don't need to think about it much. You think, you know, what's wrong with me that I should have such a problem? But maybe eventually you can't ignore it anymore and you have to do something about it. Or maybe it's none of that. Maybe it's just that you finally got old enough to realize that it's not just a rumor. It's really true. You are going to die. <laughs> and this is a very alarming thought. And the more you think about it, the more alarming it is, and the less sense it makes. The closer you examine death and dying, you cannot figure it out. What does that, what is that? How could anybody die? What is this all about? How does anybody get from here to there? There doesn't seem to be any way that that could be. And yet we are all living in the face of this dark and impossible thought. And what in the world are we gonna do about that? And sometimes it's just, you show up by chance. You actually thought you were going to a nightclub and it turned out, oh, Upai is a Zen though, not a nightclub. But it's not bad in here, nice people. And 50 years later, you know, you're the abbot or something. I don't know, it happens. <laughs> anyway, whatever your reason is for taking up spiritual practice, whether it's one of these reasons that I've noticed over the years or some other reason or a non-reason, Generally, you have a feeling that your everyday life is superficial and unsatisfactory and you are looking for something deeper and more real. So really and truly, as with all these Zen stories, the characters in the story is ourselves, right? Zhao Zhou's question is our question. We're the one who says, what is the way? What am I supposed to be doing here? And you are amazed when you hear every day mind is the way. Your ordinary life, you're going to sleep at night and you're waking up in the morning, your cup of coffee, your commute, your grumbling, your joy, that's the way. What? That's the way? My regular life? No, that's not the way. That's the problem. It's not the way. <laughs> so... What is Nanchuan getting at? 
Well, we, we are taking our everyday experience so much for granted. It is really the blue sky of our lives. Our minds, you should check this out, you know, and you'll see that your mind is so muffled with thinking and feeling all kinds of stuff, unconscious thoughts, unconscious feelings, all this stuff going on that we're not even aware of, that we barely notice our lives. Give yourself the assignment sometime of really trying. You, you, you could even like do it with a notebook beside you so you can note things down. One hour, pay attention to your state of mind as you're walking, standing, speaking, sitting. Ask yourself, what's really going on in my mind right now? And, and this you'll see, I think very quickly, how you have no idea really what's going on, that there's something always preoccupied in your mind, although it's not obvious what it is. Things are going on, and of course you have a general impression of them, enough of an impression of them to get through the day more or less with competence. But the more you examine it, the more you see, well, I'm not really there exactly. The fundamental experience, the fundamental fact on which every other fact of your life is based. A fact you probably have never really noticed is that you are temporarily alive in this human body. And that moments of time are coming and going and that you have no idea what all of this means. To be alive in time what is that? That's everyday mind. That's the way. And that's why he explains a little more, saying the way is not a matter of knowing and not knowing. Knowing is an exaggeration. Not knowing is stupidity. I think our minds are so muffled and confused because we are trying to know our life, to understand, you know, to somehow possess our life. It's my life. I got to work things out. I mean, that's just axiomatic. My life is mine. I get to do with it what I want to do. And I got to figure it out and take care of it. I don't see that I didn't do a thing to get this human life. It came to me as a gift. It is actually disappearing moment by moment. The sands of my life are flowing through my hands moment by moment and this life is not mine and it never has been. I didn't earn it and I don't understand it. So knowing is an exaggeration. It's folly. Not knowing my life, not taking possession of it, not taking responsibility for the gift. Well, that's not right either. That's being stupid. I have a responsibility here. I have to take care of my life and myself, like you take care of a child or a pet. You don't really know what's best, but you make your best shot at it with loving kindness and as much as possible without coercion. Nanchuan goes on, once you enter the where, you will see that it is as vast as space. And what does that have to do with yes and no thinking? 
And that's right, isn't it? Your life is vast as space. <clears throat> Every moment of perception and thought and emotion and action is vast as space. The stark fact, which you can actually experience and sense, though you don't experience it in the ordinary sense of that word, has nothing to do with all the different ways we have of conceiving of things, all our crude and un unexamined yes and no ideas. Our fancy human mind is capable, as we know, of figuring out a lot of stuff. And it's good that our minds can figure out a lot of stuff. But when it comes to the basic fact of being alive, our minds are not the boss. Our body, the sky, our feeling, our heart, the earth itself, other people and in our interactions with them, all of that equally is ourselves, is everyday mind. All of that equally is the path we walk together. And it's so great, you know, I think, even after all this time, I'm still impressed that we have a way to appreciate this teaching. We have a way to notice and be in tune with the vastness of our lives. Zazen practice. To sit and breathe and train yourself to pay close attention, to be able to notice the muffled mind is already to unmuffle it. And once you know how to do this, your spiritual path begins. And little by little by little, your life comes into view and the dullness begins to brighten up and you can feel what's going on the texture of a fabric, the warmth of the sun on your skin, the absolutely unique sound of every person's voice, a disturbed thought in your mind, and the world's disturbing conditions. Everything brings with it the whole of life and death when you are really there for it. That's true religious experience. We don't need fireworks. And you know, sometimes everyday mind is not so pleasant, not so inspiring. Sometimes everyday mind appears as pain and suffering. Sometimes it appears as anger, fear, greed, worry, confusion. Even the very spiritual longing that you have come to practice hoping to relieve. All these emotions are sometimes the way everyday mind appears in a moment. And they are also the way, the truth, the path. As everyone will tell you, spiritual practice is not always a walk in the park. It's not always peaceful and beautiful. But once you get the hang of it, it takes time. It is always beautiful, even when it's not. When afflictive states of mind arise, of course, we want to get rid of them. They're unpleasant. We try to figure out how come they're there. And we try to make improvements. Maybe we figure out that it's other people who are to blame for our bad states of mind or the state of the world. Or maybe we're mad at ourselves because we're so stupid. We keep doing this to ourselves over and over again. And we're trying to figure out how to make it better, how to make the changes we would like to make. But here, 
Everyday mind is away. This moment of anger, this frustration, this moment of grief or confusion, the terrible world, the horrible enemies. This is the way. What does it feel like? What does it look like? What color is it? How tall is this feeling? Can we breathe with it? Can we just allow it to be there? Allow it to have its own life within us? Can we quit trying to leap over it? Or escape? Or somehow make it disappear? And this is what Nan Chuan is telling us. Yes. Let your pain be what it is. Give it space inside of you. Bring it to your body, to your breath, to your awareness, and see what happens. So when you sit in Zazen, with every breath in and out, you can say to yourself, you can practice, this is the way. This is awakening. And you can open up your heart and be willing to see what's there. Disappointment, fear, anger. And you can say and breathe, this is the way. You're sitting there and your body hurts. Maybe you have a pain in your back or your knee. This is the way. Breathing, this is the way. Allow everything to be what it is. Don't try to figure it out or fix it. When we really appreciate this point, this point, of case 19, we're really living a different life. We no longer feel as if conditions run us and that we're constantly in need of adjusting conditions to suit, which is so exhausting. Of course, we're all practical people and we do adjust conditions where we can. Anybody would do that. I mean, if something is broken and you can fix it, of course, you're going to fix it. But we realize that happiness is not a matter of organizing conditions. It's a matter of fully appreciating the conditions that prevail. And that this is always possible. At greater and greater depths as our practice goes on. What would it be like if we felt confident that we could appreciate the moment of death when it came. Or that we were confident that we could appreciate this moment right now, no matter what it brought. What if we had that confidence? How would we live? And how would the world look to us? So nowadays I give talks and I assume that there's nothing I have ever, nothing I'm going to say that anybody doesn't already know. Actually, that's usually true these days. It used to be a long time ago, wow, this Zen stuff, amazing. But now everybody knows everything, right? <laughs> there's a million spiritual teachers everywhere. There's apps for spiritual teachers, you know. <laughs> spiritual practice is really simple, it's really easy. There's a million books and audio books and videos and online options. And almost every other person you meet is a guru. So I'm not telling you anything like astonishing here. So it's not a big deal, you know, to know these teachings. Everybody knows it now. 
That's not hard. You all could have given this talk. The hard part is living it. And in his introduction to the story, as you know, uh, Master Wuman gives a little introduction, you know, to all the stories. And in his introduction to the story in the Wuman Guan, he says, though Zhao Zhou realized something, he could confirm it only after 30 years more practice. So that was Zhao Zhou's actual life, as I said in the beginning. Though he heard and understood this teaching for himself early on, and made it the theme of his lifetime, he never digested it for 30 years. He kept on investigating it. He made this simple teaching the watchword of his whole life of over a hundred years. And he practiced it for 30 years more before he can confirm it for himself. And then he continued to practice it and appreciate it even after that. And he shared it with as many people as he could, whoever came. And the same thing is true of our dear teacher, Sojin Roshi. Every day mind is the way was his practice too. And he lived it every single day from the time he encountered it until the time he let go of his human body. And you know what? He's still living it. So I conclude with Master Wuman's verse on this case. I think this is my favorite verse in the woman one. I'm sure you've heard it before. Spring comes with flowers, autumn with the moon, summer with the breeze, winter with snow. When idle concerns don't hang in your mind, this is your best season. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening to my talk on Woman Guan, Case 19. You know, our, our Zen community is called Everyday Zen after this story. So I was really happy to be able to speak to you about it. So now what do we do? What happens now, Noah? Roshi <laughs> Norman, thank you so much. Maybe everything you said could have been said by everyone else, but you certainly transmit that everydayness and actually the miraculousness of that i was wrapped so thank you so much for transmitting that and i hope or assume you'll be doing something along those lines in the summer with us on the everyday i'll think of something yeah <laughs> well thank you so much for that um yeah um just and dear old you. friend, I, I just wanted also to thank you. That was um, uh, both inspiring and also very grounding. Uh, I think some of us um, uh, became quite um, uh, upregulated in a, you know, a state of transitory joy, <laughs> but joy nonetheless and relief. Thank and, you. Uh, very nice to see you always. Yeah, thank you. So, so grateful. And it's nice to see the uh, Zendo. You know, I guess I, now I have my screen on uh, gallery view, but I guess if I somehow or other, uh, uh, well, in the beginning, I could see uh, the Zendo. And there it is. There's the Zendo. Yeah, it's nice to be in the Zendo again. This is such a, such a fabulous Zendo with so much practice uh, in all the beams, you know, holding up the wall and the floor and, so it's nice to be in the Zendo and see everybody in the Zendo there. And two two new novice priests too. Yeah, no, that's have they has it has it happened already? Has the ordination taken place? Well, it, it happened yesterday on Dogen's that, birthday. Oh, 
Oh my goodness! Isn't that fabulous? Yeah. The shiny head I mean, on the left. Well, that explains those very very shiny heads, I guess. <laughs> oh, wow! Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. What a, what a blessing! Yes, but this goes on for many lifetimes. So you know, you're in for a long a long one, a long haul here. How wonderful! <laughs> <laughs> a long haul of every day well thank you so yeah, much a long haul of every day and every minute yeah so i think now um our our tradition is that we chant uh the four vows of the bodhisattvas and uh i'm going to go mute because there's nothing worse than the time lag turning it into total chaos but it seems that tonight is or today is the right time to really affirm those four vows.